I think personally, hope for me is just something to look forward to as I start each day in a positive way. So it's, it's something to look forward to when something good is going to happen, whether that good is created by me or whether it comes my way. And so hope is this attitude that I keep with me. And whether that's a piece that you find within yourself, a piece that you find in your spirituality, or just a piece in, that you find with your family and friends, but it brings me hope because the future is going to be positive. And so good things happen, bad things happen, but because I'm secure in all of that other, then I continue to wake up the next morning with that continued hope that there are positive things coming my way. Angelina Burney from Anchorage, Alaska, I Share Hope. Welcome to I Share Hope, the podcast where world leaders share their real stories of hope and how you can use actionable hope to start changing your life today. And now, here's your host, Chris Williams. Angelina, thanks for being with us again. A thousand interviews about hope from all over the world. So I'm really curious to hear more about you, honestly, just what you're doing on a daily basis. And then we'll get into more of your more of your life and what you think about hope as we get started. So tell me a little bit about you and then I'll ask the first question. Uh, Well, I arrived in Alaska in 1991. My parents were both born in Mexico, so I'm of Mexican descent. Uh, So I was born in New Mexico. I'm first generation American. Uh, I was raised there, but what brought me to Alaska in 1991 was that I had married someone in the military. And so we were there in Alaska for, or I'm sorry, in New Mexico for three years before getting orders to Alaska. So like many people in this day, we arrived through the military. So we spent uh, eight years here stationed at the local Air Force Base here at Elmendorf. And then we also retired out of Eielson Air Force Base. So I've lived not only in Anchorage, but also up in Fairbanks, which is about 450 miles north of here. So experienced both the south central part of Alaska as well as the interior part of Alaska. I've heard that Fairbanks is crazy cold and like way out there in the middle of nowhere. Is that, is that the way it really is? <laughs> <laughs> it is crazy cold. And I think what's significant about the crazy cold is it's crazy cold consistently for quite a long time. So we have crazy cold here at times, but it usually is maybe one or two days. But the thing about Fairbanks is the, how long the crazy cold can last. So you can have up to you know a week to 10 days of 50 below zero temperatures, and that's not unusual. Wow, that's crazy. Wow. <laughs> Don't even compute for me. Okay, so <laughs> you obviously needed some hope in the cold weather, that's for sure. <laughs> All right, so let me ask you question number one. So what is your definition or your feelings, beliefs, whatever, what do you think defines hope for you? I think personally hope for me is just something to look forward to as I start each day in a positive way. So it's, it's something to look forward to when something good is going to happen, whether that good is created by me or whether it comes my way. And so hope is this attitude that I keep with me. And whether that's a piece that you find within yourself, a piece that you find in your spirituality, or just a piece in, that you find with your family and friends, but it brings me hope because the future is going to be positive. And so good things happen, bad things happen, but because I'm secure in all of that other, then I continue to wake up the next morning with that continued hope that there are positive things coming my way. It's a great answer. Thanks. I love hearing these answers. They're so, they're so real, so honest. So thank you. The question two is who's shared the most hope with you in your life? Who's, who's really given a lot to you that's, that's given you any hope that you have today or, or at least helped you in the, that path? I will have to say that that's the combination of my parents, uh, most especially my father. Uh, my father grew up <clears throat> pretty poor. Uh, in New Mexico, we don't have the diversity that we have up here in Alaska. You're almost always either Mexican or African-American or white, but not very much else outside of that. 
So you're, are you from Mexico or just your, your parents from Mexico? Give me a little background there. Right. Both my parents were born in Mexico on the border town of Juarez, which is the border town of El Paso, Texas. So we're very, very close. Um, but my father came over to the U.S. when he was five. So he grew up in the U.S., And then my mother did not grow up in the U.S. She grew up in Mexico and didn't come over to the U.S. until she was 25 when she met and married my father. So two very different experiences for them. My father grew up poor in New Mexico, kind of up in the mountains, and um, had a really difficult life because of the prejudice that the family experienced. So... Growing up, I heard stories that he shared with me about the prejudice that was shown to his family from the rich cattle barons that were there in New, in the New Mexico area where they were from in a place called Alamogordo. So it was a place where banks didn't lend money to Mexicans because of the extreme prejudice. It was a place where they were ostracized. The white kids didn't want to play with the Mexican because Mexican kids were just trash. And so they were not very welcome in school. And because my father came from a family where it was a single mother trying to raise four children on her own where with very little resources, um, you know, just like any other time in history, kids were ostracized because they didn't have the good clothes or just the extra money. So based on what he experienced, I think what the reason that I feel hope from him is because he didn't want that same life for his children. So he, like very many other immigrants and and people that were in the U.S. for the first time, worked very, very hard so that my sister and I never experienced what he experienced. And I think hope for me also goes back to the security and that you're loved. And I recognize that I'm so blessed in that because there are so many people who don't have that. But there, I don't think I've had a day in my life, and I still have both my parents, that I'm not secure in the fact that I am deeply, deeply loved. Wow. And that's with them. And then I married my husband that I've been married to for 27 years now, and he has done been the same for me. So I recognize that that security, that peace that I carry with me everywhere I go, that is such a blessing because there's so many other people who don't have that, who are not waking up in the morning in that absolute secure place that that I'm deeply, deeply loved. And if there is ever anything um, that I need support in, I have that. And then as an extension, you move up to a state like Alaska and you move up here with no family. And so then you have to find extensions of your family. So I don't have a father and a mom nearby. They're 5,000 miles away. So your friends become your extension of your family. And they, for 20, 22 years now, my friends have been my family. And I'm secure that if something ever happens in any way, shape, or form, there are 10 people on my list that I can call. Again, a blessing because I recognize and I'm grateful because so many people don't have that. Wow, that's a great uh, story of relationships. It really is. You know, uh, on on the interviews that we're doing, unfortunately, a lot of the of the stories don't have strong relationships, and it's it's really great to hear somebody who who has that anchor um, with very few fractures, even because it's just it's unusual, but it means it can be done. You know, and if we get ahead of it in our own lives with the relationships we can we can invest in, maybe not the funds from our past, but you know, we've got a new day right now, so let's get going. It's a great, great point. Thank you. Okay, Angelina. Um, question three: Tell me more of your story. What's what's back there? What's what's been going on in your life? When was the time? Like, take us back and paint the picture about what was going on. In a, there was something that was just causing you to lose a lot of hope. What's been really hard? Because you seem like a really hopeful person when I talk to you. Uh, lots of smiles and lots of energy that's just giving me hope. But, you know, life's not hurt for anybody. So what do you have back there that we can learn from? Um, that's a true statement. Life is not perfect for everybody. Um, I am a very hopeful person and I'm a positive person. Uh, but... Probably my biggest struggle was 
uh, in my late twenties and early thirties. And, um, it was just the basic fact that, um, my husband and I struggled and we could not have children. So, um, I got married at a very young age, right after high school. So I'm a young bride, 19 years old. And I think that when you're growing up and you're a teenager, (laughs) you're spending so much time worrying about, you know, just finding that perfect person. Um, and then you do, and it never crosses your mind that something that you take for granted, like having a child might not happen. And so, um, and the fact that I come from a Hispanic family probably doesn't help either because there is a tremendous amount of pressure, uh, typically culturally having a big family and because family is so important in a central part of the Hispanic uh, Latin culture uh, not being able to have a child is um, quite shocking in a family. So uh, we took for granted that immediately after we got married, we'd have a child. And so then a year passes, and then two years passes, and then three years passes, and you don't have one. And so then you start to do what um, many people do and medically take all of the tests, look into what the problems are. In my particular case... Um, There was never a reason why. But um, you struggle with that, with just the basic fact that you are not going to have a child. And so that is hard enough. But I think that I'll also emphasize that what's really quite difficult is for a woman, that's how you connect so often with other women. So there is a lot of baby talk and there is a lot of planning your families and there is a lot of, you know, play dates and all of those things. And so for a long time, I don't fit. I don't fit because all of the people that are my same age are all now in my 20s having their first babies, having their second babies, talking about play dates, talking about college. And I'm not there. And I don't fit because I don't have anything to share in the conversation. And frankly, after a while, the the many questions and assumptions that are made about you, about whether you chose not to have children or whether you didn't have children and why, and it it just gets to be a conversation that you just don't want to answer the questions anymore. And so um, the other side of that is, as you mentioned, I am a very hopeful person and I am very blessed in the family that I have. So there's a lot of guilt that comes with that as well because you're married to a wonderful man who would have been an amazing father. And because he chose me, I've robbed him of that. So that's a really difficult thing to live with. And then you also have a mom and dad who are amazing parents, amazing parents, and who would have been amazing grandparents, but they won't be because I can't give them grandchildren. So now that puts them into that same I don't fit category because now they're in their 60s and 70s and everyone's passing around the pictures of the grandbabies and passing around the pictures of some of them now, great grandbabies, and they'll never have that. And uh, so that is a struggle that I had to really work through because the guilt part of that weighs very heavily on you. So... Do I release my husband so that he can go find someone else so that he can be a father? Um, So, you know, I'm Catholic. I have a very deep faith. And you go to church and you ask God to give you a child, the gift of a child. And the years go by and it doesn't happen. And so then you ask, you know, well, what did I do wrong? You know, why me? And so you you go through all of that. It's just an emotional roller coaster. And so I have to wake up in the morning and have to remind myself that I do have all of these other blessings. And what's going to be important for me is to not wallow in my sorrow. And I can do great things and impact other lives, even if they're not my own children. So, but it's tough. It's really tough because, you know, we're getting older now and my husband... I think really struggles with the fact that we don't have a child and now it's the unknown as you get older where there, there's nobody to take care of us so when when people are talking about as I get older I'm not going to have someone to go move in with 
and I'm not going to have someone to go, um, you know, sit on the porch with, with a bundle of grandkids on my lap. And that is something that I will never experience. And I'll never experience with my husband, the gift of those children. So we have to plan our lives completely differently than someone that does. So it's an everyday struggle, um, because the guilt sometimes can really get to you. So you, for me, it's like Shirley says, you find joy and hope in your day to day in song, in relationships and in family. And, um, you just, bless and release that sorrow and I, I just have to move past it. It's my sorrow and I know I'm certainly not the only one. There are so many others but uh, I just have to get through that. So the, I think my late 20s and 30s were, pro- 30s were probably my most challenging and certainly because that's when most women are yeah. And then I think after you pass your mid 40s I think in the back of your head you always had that just maybe just maybe the miracle will come and just you might just find out that you're pregnant just out of the blue but once you pass your mid 40s now the options are no longer there physically you just can't do it so uh it's a struggle everyone has their story it's mine i own it uh but i choose not to let it own me i've I've never, I've never heard that that succinctly from somebody who wanted to be a mom. And we, you know, many of us know somebody, maybe a bunch of people who couldn't have kids, but so many people do. It's just you don't you don't keep it at the forefront of your mind because it's not your everyday norm, you know. Um, but that that issue along with so many others that you don't know what somebody, you know, in the next cubicle over or um, riding the subway with you or, um, you know, your next door neighbor, you don't know what's going on in their life, you know, because that stuff's pretty quiet. You don't just go blabbing that stuff around. Um, Those are real deep issues. And I'm impressed with your bravery and I'm impressed with... um, I'm impressed with what you said there at the end, that it's your issue and you own it. And, and I know you don't mean your fault, but it's your issue and you own it in the sense that it's your story. You know, it's, it's the, it's what you're working with. And I don't know how often you share that story, but I promise you there are a bunch of people who are going to be thankful that you shared your story today. Um, and you're so good at that story. That sharing that, I know it's hard, but I would share it. I'm sure you have comforted a lot of the people who've already gone before you, but you, you got to be ready to share it when it's time. You'll know when it's time. You know when it's not. Thank you. Thank you. It's not like you've got a phenomenal family around you, who I'm sure your mom and dad and perfect husband are not all perfect people and haven't had perfect lives either. Um, so they probably have their own stuff that you get to support them in. Um, and obviously you got a heart for it because you know what it's like to be supported. Sweet. Thank you. Angelina, question four. What are you doing today to share hope with others or, or growing in hope yourself? But give us some just real life examples that you're working through that you're uh, doing for you or for somebody else just in the line of hope. Uh, one of the things that I really enjoy about Anchorage and... One of the reasons I got involved in the project with Vivian and Shirley May is I love the diversity of Anchorage. As I mentioned before, um, in New Mexico, there's some diversity, but pretty limited, and especially where I was from in Alamogordo, where you're right next to the Mexican border. And so really the overwhelming group of people that you'll interact with are people of your own um, cultural background, which are Hispanics. So I came to Anchorage, and such a unique place because... It took me coming to Alaska to have the opportunity to meet people from all over the world. And there are 27 Spanish-speaking countries that are represented here in Anchorage, which is amazing. So I came to Alaska to actually meet people from other Latin American countries, which is so very cool. And then there's the great diversity from just all over. Um, And so early on when I moved here in 91, I was working for a bank. And one of the first things that they were doing was outreach to the Hispanic community. 
So I ended up doing a lot of volunteering uh, for the bank at the time. Well, that kind of led me to just community volunteering as a whole. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really enjoy that. So I'm I'm, I guess what a lot of people would call a joiner. <laughs> I, I have sat on a lot of boards and on a lot of commissions, and I have volunteered for a tremendous amount of uh, events and organizations. And, yeah, I, I've got one of those magnets on the kitchen that says, stop me before I volunteer again. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah and these two would, would be able to, um, to uh, relate. So, but I find joy in that. And that's, I won't be able to do something for my own family, but my community is my family now. So if I can leave a positive stamp on my community. Uh, the other thing outside of just my nonprofit volunteer work, I'm pretty passionate about civic engagement. And so I got involved in politics in 97. And so I've run quite a few uh, political campaigns and I serve and advise on political campaigns. And again, that's, and again, it's because I care about this community. And so I want people to engage and and I support people who I think have the same vision for this community than I do. So, and I enjoy it because again, it's, it's people working together to just make this a better place to live. And so I would say that besides the family time and the service to your church and the service to your friends and family, the service to your community is very important. So that makes me hopeful. And I hope that you know, 20 years from now or 40 years from now, I can look back and say my impact, my legacy was that I left this place a better place in, in what I was involved in. And now you're working, I think you're working for a senator here in Alaska, right? I do. Uh, who's the senator? Um, it's our senior senator. Her, her name is U.S. Senator Lisa Murkowski. She's the chair of the Energy and Natural Resources Committee, and she's been a U.S. senator since 2002. I would say you're very involved in politics. <laughs> and obviously, if you're working for, for her, then, I mean, she's got to be a great person, but she's obviously, um, the two of you are able, and your whole team, obviously it's a large team, they're able to to bring a lot of hope. That's such a practical way. Politics is such a practical way. I'm not very political. Um, never volunteered for anything political. Maybe I should sometime. Um, it just sounds, it sounds like something I don't quite understand how it works yet. <laughs> I think I should. I vote. I do vote. Uh, but <laughs> it's hard to figure it all out. So, but it's a practical way to, to really get in the community and affect real change. I mean, she's getting to really bring change to a state. That's incredible. And you're getting to bring so much change to your community and so much hope. And, you know, um, something that comes up a lot is the sharing of hope in a community. That comes up all the time in these conversations. And it's so obvious that if we don't share hope, that it grows stagnant. You know, we stagnate. It's like, a, it's like a sponge that sits on the kitchen counter or under in a dark spot in the shower corner. You know how it gets. They, they just get mildewy and nasty. And it may have a lot of water which we'll use as our little analogy. That may be the hope that it has, but if it's not giving that hope back out and getting recycled constantly, then it gets to be a really nasty sponge or a nasty old rag. And you are sharing so much hope and, and recycling hope in a, in a way. Um, and every time you do it, it spreads. I think that's really cool. Thanks. So Angelina, question five is how or how can you teach me and the people that are listening with me, so many friends that I have here with the I Share Hope Project, how can we learn to grow in hope personally or to share hope with somebody else? What are the simple steps? I think something that I try and do that I think people remember is the simple gift of a smile. A smile brings so much and it's you just have to start to force yourself to smile if it's not something that's comfortable for you. But I think that the more that you try it and get out of that frown that you have on your face, it seems so simplistic, but just smile. And uh, it, I, I really think that it makes a huge difference when you wake up in the morning and just smile and, and give yourself that gift. And then when you do that with the people that you surround yourself with, that's a gift as well. And then you, you think about all of those quotes, Maya Angelou and many others, about how they won't remember anything else other than the way that you made them feel. So, like, surely I'll, you say thank you when it's warranted. 
and you reach out maybe when they least expect it just to check on them and just let people know that you're thinking of them and those simple small kindnesses go a long long way and you know I've learned at this table tonight things about my friends that I would not have known and I would have liked to have known so I could have reached out and said I'm thinking about you today I'm here for you if you need me so you may not know what's going on in your neighbor's life or your best friend's life or your acquaintance's life so a little card in the mail a little phone call a little text these days just to say I'm thinking of you and um, I'm here for you very simple and a great my Angela quote I wish I could recite the quote right now but uh, so smiling is is so important that's not the my Angela part but that is important because it makes that physical change in you makes an emotional change I don't know how it works and yeah you can fake a smile you know if you're just crying your eyes out someday and somebody walks in the office that's not super close to you, you can it's not the same smile we're talking to you know Make yourself really smile, and and then doing that with somebody else, um, it just really works. And you know, if you need to be tickled, or if you need to watch a funny sitcom, or <laughs> read the funny papers, or um, or just watch kids that you know in the neighborhood playing and doing something completely stupid in front of your house, or um, <laughs> reading the newspaper about people who do stuff completely stupid <laughs> in your community. <laughs> Laugh. It's okay. You're not making fun of them. Just laugh because you need to. Uh, but then that my Angelo part with, with people really won't remember much about you other than how you make them feel. You've just listened to I Share Hope. If you're ready to make a change, head to our website at ishareHope.com and claim your free copy of the top 10 actions of hope from world leaders to use hope in your own life. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next time. Angelina's favorite song when you're just rocking down the street, you need to feel better. What are you going to pop in? <laughs> What's going to be in your earbuds or on your stereo? Uh, anything by Black Eyed Peas. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta love that. <laughs> and if you could live anywhere besides Anchorage, Alaska, where would it be? Oh, anywhere outside of Anchorage, Colorado. What part? Mountains Denver. or uh, Denver? Denver. Yeah. I'm with you there. That's a great place. I love it. You've just listened to I Share Hope. If you're ready to make a change, head to our website at ishareHope.com and claim your free copy of the top 10 actions of hope from world leaders to use hope in your own life. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next time. There are positive things coming my way. Angelina Bernie from Anchorage, Alaska, I Share Hope. Welcome to I Share Hope, the podcast where world leaders share their real stories of hope and how you can use actionable hope to start changing your life today. And now, here's your host, Chris Williams. Angelina, thanks for being with us again. A thousand interviews about hope from all over the world. So I'm really curious to hear more about you, honestly, just what you're doing on a daily basis. And then we'll get into more of your more of your life and more what you think about hope as we get started. So tell me a little bit about you and then I'll ask the first question. Okay. Uh, well, I arrived in Alaska in 1991. My parents were both born in Mexico, so I'm of Mexican descent. Uh, so I was born in New Mexico. So it's, it's something to look forward to when something good is going to happen, whether that good is created by me or whether it comes my way. And so hope is this attitude that I keep with me. And whether that's a peace that you find within yourself, a peace that you find in your spirituality, or just a peace in, that you find with your family and friends, but it brings me hope because the future is going to be positive. And so good things happen, bad things happen, but because I'm secure in all of that other, then I continue to wake up the next morning with that continued hope that there are positive things coming my way. It's a great answer. Thanks. I love hearing these answers. They're so, they're so real. I think personally, hope for me is just something to look forward to as I start each day in a positive way. 
So it's, it's something to look forward to when something good is going to happen, whether that good is created by me or whether it comes my way. And so hope is this attitude that I keep with me. And whether that's a piece that you find within yourself, a piece that you find in your spirituality, or just a piece in, that you find with your family and friends, but it brings me hope because the future is going to be positive. And so good things happen, bad things happen, but because I'm secure in all of that other, then I continue to wake up the next morning with that continued hope that there, I'm first generation American. Uh, I was raised there, but what brought me to Alaska in 1991 was that I had married someone in the military. And so we were there in Alaska for, or I'm sorry, in New Mexico for three years before getting orders to Alaska. So like many people in this day, we arrived through the military. So we spent uh, eight years here stationed at the local Air Force Base here at Elmendorf. And then we also retired out of Eielson Air Force Base. So I've lived not only in Anchorage, but also up in Fairbanks, which is about 450 miles north of here. So experienced both the south central part of Alaska as well as the interior part of Alaska. I've heard that Fairbanks is crazy cold and like way out there in the middle of nowhere. Is that, is that the way it really is? <laughs> <laughs> it is crazy cold. And I think what's significant about the crazy cold is it's crazy cold consistently for quite a long time. So we have crazy cold here at times, but it usually is maybe one or two days. But the thing about Fairbanks is that how long the crazy cold can last. So you can have up to you know a week to 10 days of 50 below zero temperatures, and that's not unusual. Wow, that's crazy. Wow. <laughs> Don't even compute for me. Okay, so <laughs> you obviously needed some hope in the cold weather, that's for sure. <laughs> All right, so let me ask you question number one. So what is your definition or your feelings, beliefs, whatever, what do you think defines hope for you? I think personally hope for me is just something to look forward to as I start each day in a positive way. 